Hello, everyone. We're now joined by Peter Diamandis to dive a bit deeper into space. Peter started over 20 companies in the areas of longevity, space, venture capital, education, and more. And we're very excited to have him here today. Uh, Peter, thanks for joining us. No, it's a, it's a pleasure. This goes back to childhood passions for me. Uh, and what was crazy ideas are becoming real at like sort of an exponential rate. It's extraordinary time to be alive in, in humanity. That's, I, I read an article saying you started giving space lectures at eight years old to, to anyone who would listen and draw them in. And you've, you've been investing and starting companies in the space for so long. Uh, can you kind of take us through your journey in the space industry? Yeah, sure. So uh, it was. It was. In, I was born in the, in the '60s, and it was two things that got me massively passionate about space. The first was the Apollo program, and it showed us what we could do. I mean, humanity could actually land on the moon using less technology than in your watch. Um, and then that scientific documentary called Star Trek that showed us where humanity was going. Right. So it's like this is now. This is where we're going, and it lit me on fire. And I, everything I did, you know, I came from a medical family and who wanted me to become a doctor. I said, oh, okay, I can become a doctor. They'll help me become an astronaut. But everything I did was around that passion that it was during my lifetime and during the lifetime of everybody listening that we are moving off the planet irreversibly to become a multi-planetary species. We're going to take the eggs out of the basket and go to the moon, go to Mars, go to the asteroids and go beyond. And I, you know, there was like no way in hell that it was not going to be moving that fast, given how incredible Apollo was. And then things came to a screeching uh, stop when, you know, uh, NASA and the space shuttle program so, took so long to go. I gave up on my dream of becoming an astronaut. And I said, the real job here is going to be how do we ignite a commercial space industry? Uh, one where instead of going into space once in my life, I could go every weekend if I wanted, and where we create a engine to open up the space frontier that was independent of politics and was really based on capitalism, on we're going to go into space to create real value for humanity that generates capital that gets reinvested and moves us forward. And so that became my flip of an astronaut to a space entrepreneur. I uh, started a, a bunch of companies, a company called Zero Gravity. Uh, everybody listening can go into Zero G. We have a 727. You just go to GoZeroG.com and your weightless, uh, exact real weightlessness. Another company called Space Adventures. Since there was no commercial U.S. vehicles, we went to Russia and brokered uh, with the Russian Space Agency to take people to this, to the up in orbit on this to the space station and you know dennis tito here in la was our first customer for uh, 20 million the price started going up it's you know upwards of 50 60 million now anushan sari and richard garriott and many others went that way and uh you know it was then how do i make it affordable and uh, i was reading a book called the spirit of st louis that chronicles the story of of uh of Lindbergh. And it turns out Charles Lindbergh flew from New York to Paris, not on a whim, but to win a $25,000 prize. And I was like, huh, interesting, a prize. I wonder if I can create a prize for a private space flight. And ultimately, uh, it turned into something called the X Prize. It was a $10 million prize. An amazing woman, Anusha Ansari, funded it. <clears throat> and that $10 million prize attracted uh, 26 teams from around the world to spend $100 million going after it. Uh, that prize drove uh, sort of a change in people's belief that it's not just for governments. We got the FAA to rewrite the rules to allow for commercial space flight. And, uh, you know, it was in the course of that journey um, that I got to know Richard Branson, who bought the winning technology off of uh, Bert Rutan uh, and Paul Allen, uh, Jeff Bezos I'd known since college, and Elon I met in uh, in 2000 when he was just selling PayPal to uh, to eBay, and I think the early X Prize lit the fuse for commercial space flight. Uh, and hard to believe it's been 17 years since the X Prize was won in 2004, but a lot happening, a lot happening. That's Seems like the, the conversion. <laughs> yeah, the, the, 
it really unlocked the entrepreneurial spirits. Could you talk a little bit about like within the context of our modeling, it's actually the technology platform that we focus or the technology that has the, it's in kind of earliest stage and it's least, I think we can't quite tell what's going to be built on top of it. There's the low earth orbit connectivity. What do you think is going to flower out of this like spirit of entrepreneurism? In, sure. In let me space. let me contextualize it this way. The early space prong program in the late 50s, the 60s, the 70s, uh, 80s, even into the early 90s was all about taking military ICBMs, right, warheads, uh, pulling the warhead off and putting a satellite and using that technology that was only a one way delivery. It was, you know, you're not going to reuse an ICBM. It was only light once and use once. But now they you know, the guidance and control was used instead of going to the side of the planet to go into orbit. And these were expensive, right? These were uh, systems built by military contractors who didn't worry about the budget. Um, it was a Defense Department budget. And it was only these government players, the Boeings, the Lockheeds and so forth, that were the aerospace industry. Um, and then here comes uh, the furry little mammals uh, uh, you know, the entrepreneurs who in the early 2000s and through today blossomed into a real industry. You know, what shocks me is the amount of venture capital going into space, uh, you know, billions of dollars. Uh, and we've seen more space startups than ever before. You can imagine they began, as, as Sam, you were speaking to, they began the rocket business. And besides SpaceX, there is you know, a dozen other launch companies that people should be uh, paying attention to. And I can, you know, discuss them from, uh, you know, from Astra to Relativity Space to Virgin Orbit to Rocket Lab. Um, and then there are the ride to space. And then the platforms on top of that in the near term is communications. We think of Starlink there uh, and, and imaging from Earth orbit. You can think of... Uh, of planet labs there, but the long-term value of space is going to be uh, access to everything we hold of value here on Earth, metals, minerals, energy, real estate, are near infinite quantities in space. So uh, that's one of my favorite subjects. Happy to get into it with you. I mean, I think so it's, it just, is. It, oh, go ahead, it, Brett. It's, 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 there's a lot of resources out there. It seems like the economics of then deciding to bring those resources back down to Earth are probably pretty challenged, though I believe that if we are being expansive, right, that having the the resources already up there is useful. Is that the right way to think about it? Or do you think that you it, can it underwrite is, like a... It is partly. Um, it's getting resources from space that you use in space. So for example, right now, every rocket ever launched from the planet and every satellite that's gone be, beyond low Earth orbit to geostationary orbit to the moon to Mars outer planets, every, every gram of fuel on those rockets has been brought from the Earth's surface at a cost of, you know, 10,000 10, kilogram, uh, dollars per kilogram or something like that. But what if you could use the fuel that you get from space, right? So what are these rockets burning? You know, what is the Falcon 9 or even the space shuttle or the Russian Soyuz burning? It's burning majority oxygen with then kerosene or RP1 or methane, a, a carbon source. Um, but oxygen is, is the majority of it. It's, and ultimately, oxygen is something that's very prevalent on the surface of the moon. It's very prevalent in the form of ice, H2O, on these asteroids. And so if you can extract the water, break it down to hydrogen and oxygen, you've got fuel depots in space. Uh, which will be necessary, you know, when you look at what, you know, I'm a huge fan of Elon and the work that he's done. It's, um, I don't think people can really appreciate uh, how breakthrough, it, you know, his work is compared to every other company out there. It's not like 2x or 10x, it's like 100x. Um, when you look at Starship, which is going to be the dominant launch capability for large uh, payloads and volume, you know, for Starship to go to the moon and go to Mars, what's going to happen is you're going to launch a Starship to low Earth orbit. And then from the surface of the Earth, you're going to be launching a number of Starships that are delivering fuel to 
the original Starship to refuel it on orbit to go to the moon or go to Mars. And that's just expensive. So the goal and the end result is can you create the fuel depots in space? And, uh, you know, some of these uh, some of these asteroids are very rich in water. Uh, we call them comets when we see them. You know, the cometary tail is ice crystals uh, of the water sublimating off the comet and reflecting. Um, but they're also rich in other metals, platinum group metals, platinum, palladium, iridium, osmium, and so forth. But again, you know, the real estate, the fuels, the metals are, let's talk about that as, as 2030s businesses. In the 2020s, it's going to be uh, communications and imaging and maybe some manufacturing. Manufacturing has been talked about for 30, 40 years, but it's never really gone mainstream in space yet. And then to dive in on what you're saying, as the XPRIZE being this catalyst, to shift from government to commercial. Um, we're, I think we're continuing to see that. We've, we've had the SPAC boom, but where in that cycle do you think we are of space becoming you know, self-sufficient as a commercial business entity? So on the commercial self-sufficiency, listen, uh, SpaceX is pouring tons of money into Starship and to Starlink. If if it had stopped at Falcon, uh, Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy, it would be an extraordinarily profitable company on its own right now, right? It is, you have to remember that, um, that when you launch a Falcon 9 and you recover uh, the first stage, nine engines there, you're recovering 80% of the value of that. And right now, Customers are paying full bore, so it's a high profit margin vehicle. Um, the, uh, you know, other companies, there's a company uh, I love called Astra that just went public recently. Uh, and Astra is uh, built, not the largest launch vehicle, but the smallest launch vehicle. They built a, uh, a uh, rocket that has the potential to launch 300 times per year. The idea is you can launch every day. So small companies, entrepreneurs who are looking to uh, be able to run experiments and try things out in space can, in fact, uh, very rapidly, you know, fly them. Uh, so it's more like a FedEx van than an 18 wheeler. What do you think? I mean, it, it kind of the kernel of, of Sam's question is maybe the, the say it's a it's it's widely understood that it would be. Uh, nice for us to have like insurance against the earth where we have a colony in Mars and, you know, we're building colony in, on the moon. But that's it seems like a collective action problem where you need like governments to fund kind of these colonies or you would historically you would think you would have to. So what is if, if that's going to happen through a commercial angle, what do you think the carrot is that can draw capital out into kind of these exploration phases uh, is it the real estate side? Like I'm, yeah. you know, Elon's so, going to be out there. Here's here's a parcel of land on Mars, or how, how could it actually be funded? Yeah. So if we're going to go out, zoom out that far, which I I love to, because it's really the creation of multi-trillion-dollar markets uh, in space. It is going to be land rights, and it's going to be resource rights. It always has been since the beginning of uh, of human ownership, right? So. You know, when you land on Mars and you say, I claim this uh, this planet or this territory for the 100 people you brought here, I mean, who's going to stop you in that regard? Now you're developing it. Um, a few years back, I took a shot at uh, building an asteroid mining company called Planetary Resources, and uh, it was a challenge to capitalize. It was, uh, you know, early in its development. But one of the things that we did was we got the laws changed. Uh, both in the U.S. and in Luxembourg, uh, for ownership of asteroidal materials. And so, you know, put a dent in that. I'll come back, you know, majority of my investments these days and my companies I'm building are in the age reversal longevity space. I'll make my capital there and then bring it back into the space arena. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, uh, we're going to see ownership, land rights, resource rights that are going to fuel. Uh, it can't just be government based um, uh, contracts. Uh, and we'll see entrepreneurs uh, going for it. I mean, it's uh, 
it is the biggest potential uh, tabla rasa, you know, sort of new world that's ever existed. You know, I, I'll just say, you know, while while Elon is focused on going to Mars using Starship, uh, Jeff is interested in going to the moon and then fulfilling a vision that uh, of a mentor of both Jeff and myself, Gerard K. O'Neill, and his vision was instead of going and landing back on the moon and building colonies there or going into a gravity well like Mars, why don't we instead, instead grab materials from the asteroids and build what are called O'Neill colonies. These are rotating cylinders that might be a kilometer in diameter, rotating very slowly, but you're living on the inside with a million people in there and you can replicate them. And, you know, Jeff's spoken about putting a trillion humans into space using these O'Neill colonies. And if you're doing that, you're basically building new land. Uh, you're not necessarily going and trying to claim a, uh, a planetary body under UN rights. You're building new places to go and live, like we're building space stations in low Earth orbit. And of course, people may say, well, that's a crazy idea. But, you know, we've got incredible tech coming in terms of AI and robotics and new material sciences that if the idea is valued enough, um, those will materialize. I don't put those outside of the next 30 year horizon for us. On, on that, you know, I do think space is one of these areas. It's so complicated. You need convergence. Uh, it's pulling on, on everything it can get. Uh, your most recent book is on convergence of technologies. How are you seeing that being applied in space? Um, what are you seeing out there? Yeah, so the, the notion is we're living in a very special time. We're in a period of rapid exponential growth of <clears throat> computation, quantum computers, AI, robotics, 3D printing, synthetic biology, augmented virtual reality, you know, genomics and, and, and blockchain. And all of these are doubling in power every 18 to 24 months and they're transforming business models every place. I think the commercial space revolution, uh, and it really is a revolution compared to what we had just you know, 20 years ago, where we're seeing hundreds of entrepreneurial startups in this space across the board. Um, it's being made by converging exponentials, right? So another company I love, Relativity Space here in LA, uh, Tim Ellis uh, when the, is the CEO, they're 3D printing their entire rockets Right. So this is the ability to use new material science, uh, converging with 3D printing, converging with machine learning pathways and so forth to build a rocket that you could size in, in different sizes. They have their first launch coming up in the next, uh, you know, probably 90 days. And then they hope to go head to head with with uh, with something equivalent to Falcon 9. Um, you've got other companies uh, like Planet Labs. Uh, and uh, and Starlink and all of these are enabled by machine learning and AI. I mean, and another example is our ability to computer model. So it used to be when you would build a rocket, you would do the best you could. You'd light the fuse and you'd hope it works. Um, today, it's a very different world. In in as an entrepreneurial rocket uh, creator, you're going to build the rocket. You're going to uh, infuse it with hundreds if not thousands of sensors measuring every vibration everything going on and then you'll have built a very high fidelity computer model of the rocket and you're running that computer model over and over and over and over again and refining it so the first time that the rocket physically launches um you're pretty sure it's going to work and if there's you know, the sensors give you the data to you know, refine the computer model the next time and then it will work. So these convergence of technologies are are extraordinary. And what they're ultimately doing is making it possible for, you know, I hate to say it uh, jokingly, but two guys in a garage to do something that was only doable by uh, large scale defense contractors. It seems like one of the big differences of like the entrepreneurial track versus the, the government track. It's not only like the cost plus distortions in, in the economic dynamics, but also at least in SpaceX's case, their willingness to very publicly destroy their vehicles and, and publicly fail. hundred percent. Two big points there uh, uh, to, uh, 
to reinforce, Brett. The first is the government way of doing contracting historically was you give us a proposal, we're going to give you the money, you have little to no at risk cost. It's the government's risk 100%. And in that scenario, if the contractor did something that, you know, blew up or wasted money, then the agency, whether it's NASA, the Air Force, DARPA, whoever it is, would have egg on their face. So it's like, we don't want to take the risk. We're going to buy big blue. We're going to go with, you know, the large defense contractors. And the entrepreneurs were not allowed in that game because they didn't have enough experience to make it a reasonable risk for the government to risk their budget on that. Uh, then you had a situation, you know, as with Elon, he made 140 million or so on selling eBay, uh, PayPal to eBay. And he put $100 million of his own money on the table uh, to build what was then the Falcon 1 and the Falcon 1E. You know, failed three times in a row. Luckily, on the fourth time, got it to work and then got a billion dollar contract from NASA. Uh, so the entrepreneurs are, are doing it with risk capital. And because it's their risk capital and because they need to differentiate themselves from the old style, they're willing to take bigger risks. And so they're going much edgier and they're exploring different niches and ultimately coming back and delivering a service to the government that they would be foolish not to take advantage of because it's cheaper, it's higher quality, and it's really supporting, uh, you know, sort of American capitalism in this case. Having seen and started so many startups, you know, what what do you look for in a space startup or what advice would you give to uh, any space entrepreneurs who may be out there listening? It's, it's, yeah. it is such a big idea. Um, but you know, there is room to succeed as you're saying more and more so than ever. Uh, so if you are, how would you, yeah, yeah, go ahead. And if you are a space entrepreneur, just, you know, tweet at me, I'm just at Peter D. Mandis and I'd, I'd love to know what you're, what you're doing to make this a two way conversation. Um, but, uh, the the advice is ultimately um, it's not about hoping and dreaming. It's about real engineering. Uh, it's about understanding what is possible uh, in the realm of engineering. I think one of the things that distinguishes folks like um, Chris Kemp, the CEO of Astra, or Tim Ellis at Relativity, or Elon Musk uh, uh, at uh, at SpaceX, or Peter at uh, uh, at at Rocket Lab is they're great engineers. They are great engineers. So uh, it's really important for you to begin with very strong engineering. And then it's projecting where the technology is going to be in three years. It's like if you're building something with the existing technology today, by the time you bring it to market, it's going to be out of date or not competitive. So where's 3D printing going? Where's AI and machine learning going? Where is you know, whatever technologies you want to be combining, where are they going to be in three years? What's going to be possible? And can you build a product or service that is intercepting where that technology is going to be? So by the time you're building it and selling it, it's on the cutting edge. If, if you say we return to this conversation a decade from now, and things have fizzled, like it seems like the new space movement is not, it's, it was just like a flash in the pan. What, yeah. what are the fail modes here? Like what, how, how would this not come to fruition the way we're envisioning it? You know, it's interesting, right? Uh, I have had this experience. So the original $10 million on Sari X prize for space flight uh, was won in 2004 by Bert Rutan and Paul Allen. And if you had asked me back then, when do you think commercial, regular passenger travel, at least on suborbital vehicles, would be possible, uh, I would have said at the outside, it's five or six years. It took 17 years from 2004 through 2021 when Virgin and Blue Origin started giving people flights. So uh, space is hard. Uh, that's the, the first important thing. And people who are involved in space are optimists. <laughs> I think you need to be. And so it's understanding the intersection of hard work and optimism. And then, you know, one of the things that we, that's luckily going for us as 
those of you who are fellow space cadets out there, is that we've got two of the wealthiest humans on the planet uh, who are committed to this. I mean, Elon will spend every, you know, Dogecoin he has, um, sorry, every dollar he's got uh, to get humanity to Mars. I mean, this is his, his passion, his mission, and he will, you know, he will uh, keep going. I mean, he's, uh, and then, you know, the same for Jeff. I mean, I've known Jeff since, God, for 40 odd years since uh, I had started a group called SED, Students for Exploration and Development of Space, SEDS, at, when I was at MIT. And he started the Princeton chapter of SEDS. And I mean, he's been passionate. I remember meeting with him shortly after uh, he'd started Amazon. I said, what is this Amazon thing? I thought you wanted to do space. And he said, well, I'm going to make my money in Amazon and then I'll spend it in space, right? A simple two-step plan. And, uh, and he's been true to that word. So, you know, it's really great that both of them uh, are that level committed to opening the space frontier and both going in a slightly different direction. And uh, that's incredibly valuable for humanity. So the challenge is going to be, uh, ultimately, it's engineering. It's like, it just takes time to do the engineering to fail and win, you know, and, and try over and over and over again. It's aggregating enough capital. Will the capital markets support this? Um, uh, I hope so. Um, you know, and you can see what what uh, what both Elon and Jeff are doing, building traditional businesses in telecom uh, with Starlink that will fuel, uh, you know, sort of cash flow uh, for the rest of it. <clears throat> uh, and then the third thing is, will governments interfere? I mean, those are the only only three factors um, in my mind that are the biggest the biggest challenges. Uh, will governments feel like uh, don't trust commercial companies really going on their own to Mars uh, or to the moon? They need to be under our protection or under our thumb or whatever the case might be. So we're going to slow it down for whatever reason. Um, but ultimately, you know, the analysis here that I think about is this is the late 1400s, early 1500s, and we are heading to the new world. Um, and, you know, you could have asked all those explorers, what do you expect is going to happen in the new world? Uh, and I think none of them would have even understood a fraction of, of what happened over the next couple hundred years of establishing new nations, of finding new resources, of, of really uplifting humanity, because that is we are an exploring species. We are genetically bred. I'm going to work in the genetics in the, uh, a little bit uh, to explore. Uh, it's what maintained us as a dominant species on the planet. And uh, on a new frontier, it doesn't matter what you did before, you know, what color your skin is, who you were born to. It's like it's a meritocracy. Are you the best at doing this? And that drives a, a positive, vicious cycle. And so we're going to see that in space. I hope sooner rather than later, um, which is the other reason why I'm working on, you know, sort of age reversal, because I want to see this stuff happen in space. So then I guess with the last question is it's fitting, you know, uh, it was 17 years, but now we're here, we've got space tourism. Uh, how long until regular trips to Mars, do you think? Yeah, so that's a great question. I remember having an in depth conversation with with Elon about his timing. Now, interestingly enough, right? He made a decision he's going to kill the Falcon 9 line in because Falcon 9 could not get humanity to Mars. And so he went down heavy on on star on, on Starship, which is incredible. Um, it's also an incredibly uh, elegant vehicle, and I have every confidence he'll get it working. Um, his original target was 2024. Uh, and I think it's a matter of the level of, of risk that he wants to take and whether Starlink goes public to fuel it uh, beyond. But I think before the end of this decade, um, I think in the next four years, uh, we'll see Starship on the moon surface. And I think you're probably two to three years before landing humans on Mars after that. Great, Peter, thank you so much for joining us today. Brett, do you have one one final question or comment you're gonna say? 
No, I think I was going to say say thank you because I think we're we're out of time. But Peter, really yeah. loved having you on. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Look forward to being back. This is truly the most extraordinary time ever in the human race. Where I think people have no idea how you know the next 20, 30 years are going to unfold on the ground or in space. Anyway, thank you guys. A pleasure. Cheers.